A capacity evaluation is the process of determining whether a patient has the cognitive ability to make their own medical decisions. Most people at a baseline mental status should be able to thoughtfully consider whether they want specific medical or surgical interventions. However, patients who are delirious or who have other medical or mental conditions may not be in the right mind to make these decisions. In these cases, a capacity evaluation provides a structured framework for determining whether or not a patient is able to provide their own consent. Psychiatrists may be asked to evaluate capacity in difficult cases. However, all medical providers should be able to perform a capacity evaluation when talking with their patient about treatment. You can use the mnemonic curbside to remember the elements of a capacity evaluation. If a patient meets all of these criteria, then they have capacity. However, if they're missing even one of these elements, they do not have capacity for that decision. First, C is for communicate. Is the patient able to communicate meaningfully with others? If this basic criterion is not met, then assessment of capacity is impossible to perform. Of note, it's not required that the patient can speak per se, as patients who are able to communicate using other methods such as writing can still demonstrate capacity. If they can communicate, then the next step is to make sure that the patient can understand both the risks and benefits of the decision they are making. Every medical treatment has both pros and cons, like an antibiotic that can clear an infection but can also potentially injure the kidneys. Patients must be able to weigh the upsides and downsides of the proposed treatment and have a good understanding of each. Provided they can do this, the next step is to make sure that the patient can fully appreciate the situation that they're in. Different diseases have different prognoses, with some conditions being generally low risk and others being imminently life-threatening. Patients must be able to understand the likely outcome of their situation and not appear to be either minimizing or exaggerating the gravity of their condition. If they can understand their situation, then they next need to be able to describe the likely impact that the various treatment options will have on their situation in a way that is logical and consistent with existing medical knowledge. For example, a treatment that increases the likelihood of survival from 0% to 100% is going to have a very different impact than one that increases it only from 0 to 10%, and patients should show an ability to grapple with information like this. If they can understand the impact of various medical treatments, then the next step is for them to decide on a course of action by clearly and consistently expressing a preference for one option over another. Patients must not be equivocal or wavering in their response and should be able to not only state a clear choice, but also to explain their decision in a way that takes into account all of the above steps, including their understanding of the situation, the risks and benefits of the proposed treatment, and the impact that their choice will have on their condition. Provided the patient can do all of those things, however, then they are deemed to have capacity. In situations where a patient has capacity, their decision on the matter should be respected, even if it disagrees with what the treatment team thinks is reasonable. In cases where a patient lacks capacity, a surrogate decision maker should be sought. In many cases, this will be a spouse, family member, or close friend, but ultimately the most important thing is that the surrogate decision maker should be able to make decisions as the patient would have rather than basing the decision on the surrogate's own values and beliefs. In cases where the patient lacks capacity but a surrogate decision maker cannot be found, the treating team may be required to make decisions on the patient's behalf. Let's see if we can illustrate the process of capacity with an example. Say that a patient is admitted to the hospital with gas gangrene, a severe infection that is uniformly fatal without treatment. They are told by the surgeons that limb amputation is necessary to save their life. However, they refuse to go into the OR, at which point a capacity evaluation becomes necessary. First, can the patient communicate? In this case, the answer is yes, as evidenced by the fact that they are declining treatment. Next, can they understand the risks and benefits of surgery? When asked about this, they are aware of the risks, including loss of their limb for the rest of their life, but they don't seem to show an appreciation for the benefits. This is because they refuse to acknowledge the gravity of their situation, as they say that these hospitals are all part of the same plot to steal people's legs and sell them for a profit. They also do not appreciate the impact of their decision, as they state, I can't die here, I saw a vision of my future, and this isn't how I die. And they refuse to even acknowledge what medical literature says about the prognosis for gas gangrene. While they are able to state a clear decision and have an explanation for it, they ultimately do not have capacity due to their lack of understanding of the benefits of the procedure or the gravity of their situation. For that reason, a surrogate decision maker should be sought. Let's do another example to see how a patient could have a capacity despite disagreeing with their treatment team. Say that a patient is involved in a car accident and has lost a lot of blood, leaving them in a state of shock. 
However, they follow a religion that does not allow blood transfusions, and they decline to be transfused. A capacity consult is performed. The patient can communicate, as evidenced by their refusal. They are able to recognize both the risks of a blood transfusion, including the possibility of disease transmission, as well as its benefits, including improved chances of survival. They are aware of their compromised state and acknowledge that by refusing the transfusion, they are at risk of lifelong disability and even imminent death. However, they have made the decision that, for them, the consequences of not adhering to their religious beliefs are greater than the risk of death, and they are able to explain their thought process about this in its entirety. Based on all these factors, the patient does have capacity, and their wish to refuse treatment should be respected. Before wrapping up this video, it's important to point out that capacity applies to a specific decision, not to a specific patient. Someone may have the capacity to make one decision, such as disagreeing with taking an antibiotic, while lacking capacity to make another, such as wanting to leave the hospital, at the exact same moment. For this reason, capacity should be evaluated on an ongoing basis with each new major decision, rather than being applied as a blanket label to the patient. The idea of treating a patient against their will is not something that should ever be taken lightly. This is why the concept of capacity is so important, as it provides a clear standard that allows most patients to have autonomy over medical decisions, without putting severely ill patients at risk of not receiving potentially life-saving treatment. Use the curbside mnemonic the next time you're faced with this challenging ethical situation, as it will guide you in figuring out what the best next steps are. Thanks for watching this video. It was a short one, but hopefully it got straight to the heart of this important topic. To learn more about capacity, as well as the various psychiatric conditions that can potentially impair it, please check out my book, Memorable Psychiatry on Amazon. You can also subscribe to this channel to be notified when new videos are released. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you again soon.